Good morning to all our participants who are in India or South Asia. Good evening to our participants from the different time zones of North America. Good afternoon to our participants from Japan, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Australia. I don't know how to welcome our participants from Europe who are spending a sleepless night to be with us today. Anyway, wherever you are, a very warm welcome to all of you. On behalf of the Department of Economics and the Center for Development Economics at the Delhi School of Economics, it is my privilege to welcome all of you to the flagship annual event of these institutions, our Winter School 2020. As in the last three years, the Winter School is being held in collaboration and association with the Econometric Society. <coughs> but this year, the Society has sponsored four generous cash prizes of $750 each to be awarded to the best paper in each of four thematic areas. The best paper will be judged by our very, very distinguished invited plenary uh, speakers from these four areas, Professors Paul Antras, Pascalin Dupas, Vijay Krishna, and Martin Uribe. They will, of course, be introduced by the respective session chairs when they give their plenary lectures. But let me just say that we are very grateful to them for agreeing to switch to online lectures. They were originally invited and they accepted an invitation to come to Delhi and deliver lectures in face-to-face -face mode. But of course, the circumstances changed in the meanwhile and they have adjusted their schedules so as to be able to fulfill their commitment and address us virtually. Our, uh, this year, the Winter School, perhaps because of being online, attracted a record number of paper submissions, 254 to be precise, out of which 162 were selected. And these contributed papers will be presented in six parallel sessions every day over the next four days. Now this vast enterprise would not have been possible to organize, especially in this online mode, were it not for the efforts of my three colleagues on the organizing committee, Dr. Shugato Bagh, Dr. Anirban Kaur and Dr. Dibindu Maiti, who put in a huge amount of effort first in arranging for the screening of the submitted papers, plotting them in different thematic sessions, keeping in mind thematic coherence as well as to the extent possible the location of the speakers, and organizing the technology and the human resources to allow the event to be carried forward in virtual mode, which required a massive technological upgrade of our facilities. We have never had to organize so many parallel sessions, each with its own chair and IT support. And for that, we are very grateful to the members of the organizing committee. We are also grateful, of course, to our sponsors for many years, the Export-Import Bank of India, who have been with us uh, over several winter schools, and some of them will actually be with us. Uh, one of their senior officials will be chairing a session, and many of their research staff will be in the audience attending several sessions. And Finally, I would like to thank my staff, that is my 
and his responsibility as executive director of the Center for Development Economics. The staff of the CBE has really worked overtime, coming in to work all day, every day, when most of the rest of us have been working from home. And they will continue to be on site to make sure the arrangements for online delivery of the lectures goes without a hitch. So I would like to thank all of them. And also the team of student volunteers who will be uh, in the background virtually for each session and making sure the delivery and the timing is uh, goes off without a hitch. I calculated that the paper presenters come span 18 time zones from Vancouver to Melbourne. And uh, it's a sign of your commitment that you will be uh, delivering your papers and listening to other presenters at all odd hours of day or night. So uh, this promises to be a very, very rewarding event for all of us. Before I conclude, let me uh, acknowledge that there is one aspect of our winter school which we could not replicate in virtual mode. And that is the conference lunches and coffee sessions on the lawn of the Delhi School of Economics, which are usually at their best in the December sunshine. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get it this year, but uh, that has always, that kind of informal interaction on the sidelines between the speakers, especially the distinguished plenary speakers and the young researchers has always been a wonderful opportunity to interact more informally and to gain their insights that unfortunately could not be reproduced in virtual mode, nor could our conference dinner at a heritage uh, hotel nearby. But let me hope that in years to come, many of you will be able to join us when we go back to our standard format and enjoy these aspects of the winter school as well. So without any further delay, let me not uh, push the first plenary session, which will be a lecture, first of three lectures by uh, Professor Paskamin Dupad, joining us from Stanford. And it will be chaired by my colleague, Professor J.B. Minakshi. Over to you, Minakshi. Uh, thank you, Aditya. It is indeed my great pleasure to introduce Professor Pascaline Dupar of Stanford University. Pascaline can perhaps best be described as a person who has been an integral part of what many have termed the rigor revolution in development economics, and indeed in empirical economics in general. Her research has focused on health, on education, and on household finances. She has been a pioneer in using experimental methods, for example, to elicit the willingness to pay for insecticide-treated bed nets as a prophylaxis against malaria. And she's also very well known for her work on reducing HIV transmission, particularly among teenage girls. Some of her current work looks at whether and how decentralized targeting of welfare subsidies can improve not only efficiency, but also ameliorate poverty. Although much of her work has focused largely on Sub-Saharan Africa, I learned actually recently that she also has a paper on the impact of COVID on non-COVID health outcomes uh, in India from a couple of months ago. 
She is a member of the Econometric Society and has served as the editorial, various editorial capacities of several top-ranked journals, including the JDE, the AER, the QJE, to name just a few. She has also been a member of several development research networks, including BREAD, JPAL, and the Global Development Group at Brookings. We are indeed very privileged to have her speak at our winter school. Before I turn it over to Pascaline, a word on logistics. Uh, if you have questions for her, please post your questions in the chat box. I will not only chair this session, but serve as moderator and unmute myself and interject your questions at the appropriate moment. So please be patient. And as time permits, perhaps at the end, we can open it up. So I request all of you to be on mute mode so that we have minimal dis disruptions and certainly turn off your videos. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pascaline. Great, thank you so much for the very generous introduction and thank you for inviting me to participate uh, in the Winter School. I very much hope that by participating online, I don't forego the chance uh, to come uh, in person uh, in the future. So I'll be um, giving three lectures uh, on, on health, uh, health in uh, lower income countries. And we'll start today with the first lecture on disease and development, taking a, a bigger picture view before we dive uh, tomorrow uh, in the issues of uh, you know, demand for health. So looking at households and the day after uh, looking at the supply um, of, of health services and uh, as uh, Minakshi mentioned, I've actually started working on health issues in India uh, four or five years ago now with Radhika Jain, um, who is also a postdoc uh, at Stanford. And uh, uh, in, in my lectures tomorrow and uh, on, on I mean, I guess Tuesday for me, for you, it will be Wednesday. Uh, I, will, I will touch on that work. Um, but today we'll take a, kind of like a, a, a bird's eye view to get going. Um, and I'm going to share a map that you are all very familiar with, I'm sure, which is a map of uh, GDP per capita. Uh, that's from you know 2016, but it wouldn't look that different if I had, um, you know a, a different year. And what I want you to notice is a very well-known fact that most countries that are you know, deemed lower income, so the red um, countries, are located in between the two tropics. Okay, so there's a tropic of cancer who goes through Mexico, uh, the Sahel, you know, through India uh, and China. And there's a tropic of the Capricorn that goes right um, by the uh, tip of Argentina here, um, Southern Africa and, and through Australia. And so most countries that are lower income are located in tropical, um, in between the two tropics. And, uh, you know, Almost all of the countries who are not um, who, are, who are high income are outside of the tropics. Okay, so the very simple question we're going to be trying to answer today is whether there is something about the tropics that makes it harder for countries to grow. Um, and and we're not going to be looking at that question exhaustively because there's a whole aspect of that question that would be answered uh, by looking at uh, the climatic conditions and how they matter for. Um, agriculture, uh, uh, you know, soil um, and uh, other agricultural potential. So we're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to focus on one aspect through which the tropics could make it harder to grow, which is the disease burden. Okay. There are a whole bunch of diseases. There are a lot of tropical diseases. Uh, some diseases are not just tropical, but they do better in the tropics, if I may say. So you've heard of malaria, um, the yellow fever, dengue, Ebola, you know, helmin, sleeping sickness, many other things with names that are increasingly <laughs> complex to pronounce. So I'm going to skip the pronunciation and just let you uh, read the slide. And uh, if you look at you know, the correlation between GDP per capita and a measure of health, uh, which is life expectancy at birth, you know there is a, there is a very, very uh, strong positive uh, correlation. OK, that's called the Preston curve. OK. So you know the, the 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 longer people live in a country, um, the richer that country is. Um, you can look at other measures of health. This is uh, anemia. 
um, on the left axis, on the, uh, sorry, um, Y axis here, you see the percentage of women who are not anemic. Okay, so it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the higher the number, the better off the country in terms of health. Um, and on the X axis here, it's the luck income per worker relative to the US. Um, and, and so the, the more on the right you are on that scale, um, the, the more productive you are. And there is again, a very strong positive correlation Yet another measure of health would be uh, the percentage of babies who are, you know, low birth weight. Um, you know, the, the poorer you are, the more babies are born with low birth weight. Okay, so you can take pretty much any uh, health measure that you want and look at the correlation with GDP and it's gonna be very, very strong, okay? That's across countries. Now also within country, there is co-movement of health and income. Okay, so in fact, in the US, the mortality hazard declines with income and with education. It's actually hard to know, you know, what's the, the role of income versus education. Um, also in the US, life expectancy actually um, is becoming increasingly uh, greater for the rich compared to the poor, okay? So the gap is growing between rich and poor within the US, okay? Uh, in terms of life expectancy. Rashid has done some work recently on this and all the data is available at this website. Now in low income countries, this you know, co-movement of health and income is even greater than in high income countries. Uh, in fact, the under five mortality is more than twice as high among the bottom uh, quintile of the income distribution within a, a poor country uh, compared to the top quintile. And that's true even within urban areas. So that's what you can see here in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, the mortality rate per thousand live births that was for the period 20, 2005, 2013. Uh, the urban poorest had a mortality rate uh, that was very high, uh, almost 120 per thousand live births. That's 12%. Okay, that's extremely high, um, and that's you know twice as much um, as the the richest 20% in the urban areas. Okay, um, and and you see this uh, same ratio even in the the, the the problem is not as, as bad in terms of sheer, you know, absolute numbers, but the ratio between the forest and the riches uh, is very similar across uh, the other continents as well. So obviously the question is which way does the causality go? Is it that when you have more income, you're better able to afford good health? Or is it that when you have good health, uh, you can generate more income? And obviously the answer is, well, it must go both ways, okay? Um, health uh, likely matters for productivity and, and health is a normal good, so it's gonna uh, rise, uh, rise with income. But it's helpful to think about, um, you know, the evolution of, of income and health over the very long, uh, you know, um, run to think through, um, you know, how to, 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 to start thinking about you know, disentangling this two-way relationship between uh, income and health. Um, so prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was actually very little long-term change in average health. There was you know, considerable short-term variation. There were periods that were extremely bad. So the Black Plague, uh, you know, that a lot of people have talked about the Black Plague recently because COVID has like brought back <laughs> um, some of the historical, uh, you know, um, uh, analysis of the Black Plague, uh, a third of you know, the European population uh, arguably died during the Black Plague. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that was um, a period of extremely um, bad health outcomes. And then it went back to you know, some sort of normal, which was not much better than it was before. Okay, so it was not, really not much uh, change. Um, and in fact, gaps across countries were quite small. No country was kind of doing well uh, health-wise. And then uh, there was a kind of a takeoff uh, of health in Europe and its offshoots um, in the 19th century. By offshoots, I mean the uh, countries where Europeans settled um, during colonization. We'll go back uh, to this issue a little bit later. Um, so in the 19th the Um, a takeoff 
And then in the middle of the 20th century, health improvements um, started um, happening, uh, you know, with a much, uh, much faster pace in, uh, in other countries as well. Okay, so the trading countries uh, began seeing faster improvements in health compared to the leading countries, which means that there's been kind of a convergence in the last 50 years in terms of health which has been much stronger than the income convergence. And so this timing, what does it tell us? Why did I want to go back a, a thousand years to think through this? Well, it's because this timing suggests that there's a very important effect from income to health, okay? Um, with positive spillovers, okay? So the reason why health started doing better um, after you know, the, the you know, um, industrial revolution um, is because it really started with improved standard of living, especially nutrition. You have to start by having proper nutrition um, to, you know, to start um, having, um, you know, stronger, stronger health. So that's what happened in Europe um, after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, households started having more resources; they were eating better. And then there was a spate of uh, public health investments again thanks to the higher income that was uh, uh, available, um, there is much more investment in clean water, in particular in sanitation. There's a paper by Kettler and Miller, Thompson and Fine, that estimates that a good chunk of the decline in mortality in, in US cities in the first half of the 20th century came from uh, infrastructure improvements in water quality, okay? So a lot of the decline in, in the health um, uh, problems came from massive uh, in, in investments in infrastructure. And then there were uh, a lot of medical innovations. So antibiotics and other drugs, um, surgery, etc. that really came about, you know, uh, full force around the middle of the 20th century. And so in the high income countries, you know, these three things really happen in the order I described. First, improve nutrition and public health investments, and then you know, innovations with sulfur drugs and things like that. But in the catch-up countries, the order was different because they benefited from the medical discoveries in high-income in, in high countries. So they got the, you know, medical innovations. This point number three showed up in many, uh, you know, poor countries, even if they had not yet kind of gone through uh, one and two, okay? Um, so they kind of like benefited uh, from these positive spillovers, the innovation uh, from other countries. It doesn't mean that there is uh, no need for, you know, for one and two. And in fact, there's still a lot of health issues um, in, in, uh, in lower income countries uh, that come from the fact that nutrition may still be an issue. And there is not, um, you know, uh, many areas with, with lack of access to, uh, to clean water. Uh, a lot of areas with a lot of uh, prevalent malaria that has not been eradicated. All this would require massive um, infrastructural efforts um, or you know, er er eradication campaigns that it's not an individual household that can do anything about. Okay. Um, but thanks to number three, uh, there has been a shifting up of the Preston curve. And that's what you can see here. Um, it's actually quite remarkable that for the same uh, you know, GDP per capita in 1990 international dollars uh, in, you know, I guess, let's, let's go here. In 1800, for that amount of money per capita, you would you know, live until the age of 40. By 1950, you live until the age of 60. And by 2012, seven, close to 70. Okay, so that's the shifting on the Preston curve for the same GDP per capita, you live much longer now because there's been a lot of, of innovations um, in, in, in medicine that uh, help uh, prevent a lot of um, death. So I've been seeing a screen pop up. I see if there is a lot of messages. So I don't know. Should I stop here and see if there are any, any questions um, that I should answer before I go on? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't read the chat <laughs> questions myself. Just maybe one, and you could perhaps choose to do to talk later. The question asks, uh, why were developed nations with better health capacities and lower population density more affected, at least initially during the COVID spread? And you may choose to come back to that later if you wish, because I think this relates to 
the some of the Preston curves that you have been putting up? Oh, I mean, that's, I think that the, 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 that, that, I mean, the question is, <laughs> um, uh, is not quite related to what I was talking about. I'm happy to, to try, I mean, to provide information about that. I think the, 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 the you know, the main reason why, um, you know, if the richer countries, if I may say, were affected more is because they are much more connected. Um, so there are many more flights going from China to Europe or from China to the US every day than there are flights going from China to um, any country in Southern Africa. So the, the, you know, the, the, the way the virus uh, you know, spread is that, you know, that it traveled with people obviously. Um, and there are many more you know, uh, folks from, from Europe and the US going to China for business or folks from China going to Europe and the US for business and the reverse. So you know, then, then people didn't quite know that the virus was around at the beginning. So it started like spreading, as you know, it, it spreads very easily before people can realize. Um, and then by the time they realized, they started locking down. Um, and many uh, countries, you know, India is one of them. Um, many countries in Africa um, as well adopted very strict lockdowns at the you know, exact same timing as European countries did, uh, even though the virus had not yet uh, reached them as much. And so by locking up earlier, um, they can like, also help stem um, the, the, the spread. So that's one, one, one reason that there was less contamination to start with by the time people realized. Um, and so the you know, lockdown was kind of like happened earlier. Um, so that, and, but then there are you know, some other factors um, that could explain why a lot of uh, tropical countries have been faring better with respect to COVID. One is that people spend much more time outdoors and there's less transmission outdoors. Uh, the other one is that the population is much younger, considerably younger. And we know that young people are um, less likely to face um, severe versions of COVID or to, you know, um, to, to die from it. Um, and now there's also some um, seroparinone studies that suggest that uh, people may actually have been somewhat uh, better immune against COVID because of prior exposures to other, you know, re related coronaviruses. Um, so that's, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, possible things uh, happening um, here that could explain why, uh, if anything, <laughs> this is a case where the virus, the coronavirus has been, uh, you know, more detrimental in, in, in um, higher income countries uh, than lower income countries on average, although in Latin America has not been doing uh, well at all. Um, so that's one area where um, the, you know, the, the, the conditions seem to not have been um, great uh, in terms of preventing this, the spread. So it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it has nothing to do really with rich versus poor and more with uh, um, other circumstances, I guess. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on. Um, yeah, good. Uh, the I mean, if there are other questions like that, um, I'm happy to to take them. Uh, maybe maybe at the end, um, if there are some questions about something that I said more specifically, then that that's um, I, I can answer them as I go. Um, okay, so you know, likely there's a two-way relationship uh, between health and income. Um, when you have a two-way relationship, that um, when you can have multiple equilibria um, uh, and that can give rise to poverty traps, okay? So we're not gonna go into the details of you know, the theory of poverty traps here. We're gonna instead uh, hone in on, on, on the question of whether there is a causal effect of health on development. When I say, you know, I've you know, told you a lot of stories saying there is an effect from income to health, but now the argument that if you, have, uh, you face a higher disease burden, it's gonna be harder to grow as a country um, that's something that actually has been quite, uh, uh, you know, so <laughs> not uh, the subject of much consensus. Um, so, you know, in today's uh, world after COVID, asking the question of whether, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the health matters for, for development seems maybe, um, you know, not necessary. <laughs> you may say, do we really need a whole lecture on this, given that, uh, 
COVID has hit the global uh, economy um, very badly. And as soon as uh, you know, it became clear that it was there, uh, the IMF re revised its estimates uh, for 2020 um, you know, very drastically. So January 2020, when the IMF had no idea about COVID, it was not yet uh, clear um, that, that, that we were going to be hit uh, by anything. They were expecting the uh, global economy to grow by 3.3% on average. And by April 2020, they had revised that to minus 3%. Okay. And then by June, they were like even more pessimistic at minus 4.9. And then thanks to good news about, you know, vaccines um, on the way, uh, it's revised uh, its projections slightly less, uh, you know, pessimistically um, from minus 4.9 to minus 4.4, but still, um, still pretty, uh, you know, pretty bad. So, you know, that in itself already tells us, okay, when, uh, when health is not great, uh, clearly it's harder, um, you know, to, to be, to be, to be productive. Okay. Um, so I'm still going to go ahead with the lecture because, you um, Already, you can see from this graph that uh, you know, you know, we expect 2021 you know, to see to see kind of like a rebound, okay? Um, and so, you know, people may say, well, COVID-19 was really exceptional, and then uh, we don't expect um, it to have uh, a, you know, an effect on on uh, growth in the, in the long term. Um, and so, I still think it's worth um, going through. Uh, the reason why, even you know, you know, before COVID, uh, it seems to me pretty clear that the disease burden um, matters for 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 growth, and that having uh, facing a worse disease burden can be a fundamental cause uh, of lower economic growth. Okay. So the first thing to think about are the mechanisms. You know, what are the mechanisms through which um, a high disease burden could matter for growth? There are many obvious things if you know you were uh, in an amphitheater uh, uh, with me I would uh, pose and ask you to you know volunteer um, all the mechanisms that come to mind uh, unfortunately we are not in that situation so I'm gonna have to go ahead um, and you know give you the the, the 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 answers as we go but obviously there can be a direct effect of disease on productivity which you know this direct effect effect itself can have multiple forms First, you know, when you have a greater disease burden, uh, it actually contributes to poor nutrition because many, um, you know, diseases can actually eat whatever you know food you're eating, um, or, or you know, um, lead to anemia, things like that. Um, that lowers productivity. It can so chronically. It can also um, lead to many illness spells, which means your days worked. Uh, either because you're sick yourself or because you're caring for a sick relative. Um, there can also uh, be an effect of the disease burden in terms of your potential, your productivity potential, once you're born through exposure in utero. So there's a lot of literature showing that exposure to diseases in utero or in early childhood reduces your endowment, both physical and uh, cognitive. And so that, that also uh, gives uh, lower productivity. And then on top of those you know, direct effects of this is on, on productivity, you're gonna have an indirect effect um, that is gonna come through uh, the lower levels of investments in education, okay? So when you have a high disease burden, you spend you know, quite a bit of money on, on healthcare, that reduces the income available for investments in education um, and other you know, aspects of production. You also have, if you you know you face a high disease burden, uh, you face a shorter life expectancy. Often, that may reduce the returns to investing in education. You know, uh, for those of you who are you know, still in, in graduate school, um, you know, think of okay, you maybe you maybe you know 28, 29. By the time you graduate from the PhD, you may be 30. If you your life expectancy was you know, 45, would it have made sense to be in school until you're 30? Uh, probably, uh, probably not. Obviously, there is you know education is also a consumption good. I'm sure you're having a lot of fun uh, sitting through these lectures. Uh, you know, sheer joy <laughs> of our education, but 
Nevertheless, typically we think of education as an investment. If you can't reap um, the benefit of your investment over a long time, um, you don't invest as much. Uh, there's also something that economists uh, very elegantly have coined the quality quantity trade-off, although it has not been you know, tested or like it has not been um, shown empirically to, um, it's kind of hard to have an empirical test of the quality quantity trade-off, but um, the idea that if you have a high disease burden, uh, that means a high infant mortality. So parents have to, if they want to reach a given um, fertility level, they have to kind of like overshoot, um, have more children um, in case some of them die. And so uh, that can lead to a quality quantity uh, trade-off uh, because they have more children um, to feed and, and to educate. Um, so they cannot invest as much in each. The disease burden also means sometimes that children have to take care of their sick parents or that they become orphan uh, early on in, in life, which means that they have to, um, to work uh, as a child, either because they have no parent to take care of them or they have to make up for a sick parent not be able to work. Um, so that also reduced um, investments in education. So you see already that there's gonna be a direct effect of the disease burden on productivity, an indirect effect through um, investments in education, or even the, the even if you spend time in school, if you're actually um, you know, sick, uh, it's harder to benefit from the schooling. And then on top of that, uh, you're gonna have much less um, investments in infrastructure, uh, many of your businesses are gonna come, uh, if you have an unhealthy workforce, uh, why? Because um, think of you know the uh, the CEO of you know Nike <laughs> thinking about where to um, you know source their next uh, batch of t-shirts from. Um, they are probably not going to be super excited at the idea of going to a country that still has a lot of malaria and where they feel like the absenteeism of the workforce is going to be high because of malaria. Um, and if they themselves go and want to visit the factory, they are going to be at risk of getting malaria. Okay, so it, you know, the disease burden can deter foreign direct investment. That's maybe the most um, you know obvious place where that's going on. Maybe Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, is a continent where you know the GDP um, growth between 2005 and you know, 20. 2018 was actually uh, you know, higher on average than the world average. So Africa was, was growing faster than the world during that period of time. Um, you would expect capital to flow, flow to the countries um, where the returns are the highest, but that did not happen. The share of Africa in the world FDI um, is, you know, is very low, uh, very, very low and remains very low. And you know, in part, it's because um, of the fact that uh, the disease burden is uh, keeping uh, investors uh, at bay. Um, it also keeps tourists at bay, okay? so you're less likely to benefit, uh, to get income from tourism if you face a very high disease burden. Um, and you may in fact have people leave. You may have more out migration of those who can afford to leave, uh, which means you have fewer resources in countries. So think of like the brain drain, that's something that people often talk about. Um, you know, if you you go get educated um, to another country, likely that you want to come back to your home country may be also lower um, if the disease burden in, in your home country is such that now you're worried um, for, for yourself um, and your family if you come back. Um, and then the last, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, this is actually, I'm sure you, you guys came up with some extra mechanisms. This, this is not exhaustive, it's already, uh, you know, uh, quite a number, but there are, are, are more and some nuances on, on what I've just said. But one that I want to take a little bit more time on is the fact that when you have um, a high disease burden, in particular for communicable diseases, then that may lead to the adoption of social structures that reduce disease transmission. Okay. And that's a mechanism that you're all, you know, uh, intimately uh, familiar with now that we've been. Uh, under COVID-19 uh, restrictions for nine months. Uh, if you uh, reduce uh, interactions, if you enforce social distancing, 
you have less transmission of viruses, okay? So if you're a community that faces, or a society that faces a high disease burden and that's communicable, you're gonna have a tendency to kind of like avoid um, mingling as much. And that may deter diffusion um, of new technologies and restrict restrain economic development. So that's a point that was made by uh, Fogli and Velkamp um, in a paper called Germ Social Networks and Growth. And they have um, this schematic, um, which I think are, are very um, useful to just like show the extent to which this matters. So they compare what they call a collectivist society to an individualist society. So in a collectivist society, you have, you know, people, you have, you, you know, a given node in, in that network is going to have, um, you know, two friends who are friends with each other. Okay, so that's like our COVID bubble nowadays. We know no one interacts with too many people. You just have like two people you interact with and they interact with each other, and 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 that's it. Okay, versus the individualist society where wherever you are. Um, you just can interact with somebody like, you know, uh, all the way there and all the way there, okay? And they may not interact with each other, okay? And so what uh, I'm gonna show you is that, imagine that you have like a disease uh, that is being transmitted here, okay? Uh, this is period one, you have these two people in yellow who've gotten, uh, been contaminated. Period two, okay? Uh, you you have you know each this this person remember had four contacts you know one two three four um, so they, they contaminated um, all four contacts um, period three period four period five period six so in six periods in the individual individual society everybody has uh, been contaminated but in the collectivist society uh, it's going to take another one two, three, four extra periods, okay? So this is to show the extent to which um, the structure of the network is gonna matter for diffusion. Um, if you adopt such a network to reduce diffusion of diseases, then you know the argument is that it may actually also uh, matter for diffusion of ideas. And that's, that's bad, you want ideas to diffuse, okay? So if you have to adopt structure that prevents diffusion of diseases, that means that it's harder for you to also get diffusion of ideas and of technology. And so that may uh, reduce, um, you know, uh, development. So uh, in the paper, uh, uh, Fogli and Belkem show that if you look at the pathogen prevalence for a given country, so that's, you know, looking at uh, the nine of the deadliest communicable diseases, and they are listed here on the slide. Um, the countries that have much more, uh, much more uh, pathogens, a much higher prevalence, are much less individualistic on this uh, Ofsted individualism index. Okay, so very strong relationship between the disease burden um, and the uh, and the individualism measure. Okay, all right. So all the mechanisms that I've discussed so far were focused on the you know, human diseases. I just wanted to mention that there can also be animal diseases. The tropical disease burden can also matter for animals. And in particular, there is one, um, one issue uh, in Southern Africa. There is something called the tete fly, um, unique to that uh, continent. And the tete fly transmits um, a disease that's that's not great if you're a human and you get it, but it doesn't kill you as a human. It does, however, kill livestock, okay? And that's really a problem because if you don't have livestock, there is a lot of stuff that you cannot do um, as easily. <laughs> um, first, you can't, you know, you can't make uh, money from um, exporting, uh, you know, um, beef or things like that, like uh, some countries in Latin America have done uh, very well. But maybe more importantly, you don't have uh, domesticated animals to help you transport um, stuff or to help you, you know, plow, um, to help you, um, you know, work on the field. And so that can um, really be a problem for agricultural productivity. It can also be a problem for institutions. Um, so there is this very nice paper by Marcia, Martha Alsan uh, that looks at this, and she shows that there is a very strong, uh, you know, 
relationship between uh, suitability to the TC uh, fly as measured by um, historians um, uh, and she you know, her some interesting uh, maps um, and uh, levels of development uh, today. I don't, I'm not going to show you the detail. This is kind of just like the eyeball metric where you just compare, uh, you know, these areas with a lot of tsetse and these are the areas in Sub-Saharan Africa that do the worst. Obviously, she does a much finer job in the paper. She looks within a country um, and finds a relationship, okay. Uh, but what's very interesting is that the, the mechanism may not just be through the fact that animal diseases prevent you uh, from uh, doing, using, you know, animal traction. Um, in, in, in reducing the productivity, it also means that you need to go for an alternative to animal traction. If you cannot use bulls to do the hard work, uh, it turns out that you may have used um, slaves. And so what Marcela shows is that uh, greater um, uh, presence of the city fly in the pre-colonial period uh, was correlated with higher use of indigenous slavery. And that meant that you know pre-colonial institutions were actually quite you know extractive in these areas um, that had the CCFI, where you know some groups were um, dominating some other groups um, in order to be able to um, you know use labor, uh, human uh, labor instead of animal labor. And so that's also uh, you know reminiscent of an earlier paper by Simon Johnson and Robinson that also mentioned a relationship between the disease burden. And the quality of institutions. Okay, in, in their paper, uh, you know, it's a very well-known paper, so I'm sure you know of it. Um, they show that the disease burden at the time of colonization determined where Europeans settled en masse uh, and where they only sent a few people, and that determined which institutions were established. Why? Because if you only have, you know, a few people, um, and they're uh, on the ground with the goal um, of extracting as much as they can um, of the local population, then you need to establish institutions that are gonna be extremely extractive where you restrict decision-making to a very small um, elite and you exclude everybody else from decision-making and from um, income, access to income. Versus um, in, in areas like in the, you know, in the, the US and Canada and Australia where the Europeans settled, um, obviously it was terrible for the indigenous population which was essentially decimated um, uh, in, you know, when, when the Europeans settled. But then the, the Europeans um, wanted institutions that were inclusive where everybody had access um, of, you know, of a way of accessing decision making power uh, and income. Okay. And so that's, you know, in their paper says the disease burden predicted the, you know, potential mortality of European settlers, which explains whether they were settlements, which led to better early institutions. And then because there was a institutional lock in, um, these same countries that had better early institutions also have better current institutions. Okay. And so interestingly, the Asimogu Johnson Robinson paper, they, are you know, pro-institution. They write their paper saying, this is really institutions that, that do matter. Um, the reason why some countries are doing very badly is because they have the wrong kind of institutions and we can show you the effects of institutions on, 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 um, on growth because we instrument institutions quality with this uh, European settler mortality. And I like to think of it uh, in a bit differently and say, well, you know, what you're telling us is that the disease burden um, that was there um, at the time, which is still highly correlated with the disease burden today, explains institutions um, that were chosen. And so ultimately, it kind of all comes, goes back to the geography and the, and the, and the disease burden. Okay. So uh, I'm going to maybe pause here and see if there are questions. Yes, two, two right now, Pasquale. Yeah. So first uh, asks, uh, aren't all these mechanisms linking health and growth? presupposing that growth happens through labor. So what happens if growth happens through capital augmenting technology? That's the first one. Um, a second asks um, that collectivism is often associated with being more socially conscious, especially in a closed society. So in the case of a communicable disease, people may consider it a social responsibility to contain the spread 
safer by using masks. And that could be a factor contributing towards a slower diffusion of communicable diseases in a collective society, an argument that would hold over and above the network-based argument that you presented. So would you be would you comment on on sort of the the extent to which that argument would be valid? Um, so uh, so on the on the first one, um, the I mean the to the extent that the you know, capital is going to be complement with labor. Um, the capital owners will still prefer to go to places where the you know labor is going to be uh, uh, you know healthier, I guess. And so that what I was trying to say when I was saying that there is not as much FDI uh, for indirect investment going to Africa as, as you would think, um, given the you know GDP growth that they have experienced. It's like this puzzle as to why capital is not actually flowing. Um, there and so I, I'm like conjecturing that the you know health this is burden may be part of the part of the story, um, but you know it's, it's the, I agree with you that if you if you don't need uh, labor in any way uh, and it's just about capital, um, then you know the health will matter. But it it seems like there are many you know capital is by itself um, is never going to be uh, is never going to be enough. So even if you you know you're going to need to have still um, no, transportation, <laughs> um, and yeah, so you need to have you know to be able to to build the you know the the road networks, the railroad networks, to be able to you know transport um, the, the 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 capital, and all of this is going to require um, some some manpower. Um, but you know the the and it's kind of um, if you have no um no need for for labor also it's not clear that the you know the population uh in poor countries would benefit from growth at all um if um if if it was um if a lot of the technology was uh, you know labor saving so in terms of thinking of the well-being of the household i think it's important um to also think of all the other uh, activities that um, they could do <laughs> uh, that would increase their income. And uh, the second question about collectivism, so I'm not sure I understood the question fully. If um, the argument is that, well, if you're a more uh, collective society, you are gonna adhere, you're gonna adhere to prevention guidelines more. So you're gonna be more likely to wear masks. Um, then that would mean that you would even be even more protected from diseases as a collective society than you would be um, just from the network. So fine, absolutely. But that doesn't, uh, the argument I was uh, making based on Fogli and Belkamp was that um, if you have um, more, you know, a bunch of tight knit communities that are isolated from each other, that that's when you know ideas, innovations don't 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 diffuse. So if you're saying we don't need to have tight knit communities uh, to protect ourselves from communicable diseases because we can just wear masks, then okay, that means that this channel um, through which the disease burden could matter for uh, development through diffusion of ideas being slower is would, would not be there. So that's fine. I, I was making. Uh, uh, the potential connection. I don't think that there is actually necessary evidence for this mechanism. I think it's an intriguing uh, conjecture that Fogli and Wilkamp made that this could be part of the story. I don't think they go all the way to showing uh, that is there. I think that um, there is, you know, it, it's actually very difficult to be able to say if we see any an effect um, of the disease burden on growth later on. Uh, to know whether it goes through their mechanism or through all the others I've discussed is extremely difficult. So I'm not saying necessarily that the mechanism is there, I'm just saying that's one of the ones you can think of. So hopefully I answered the question. That's good. So uh, there are a couple of uh, people who have raised their hands. Let me just request them to put their questions in the Q&A so that we don't waste time having people uh, unmute and, uh, you know. Okay. Etc. So, 
request yeah. that I want to make. Uh, please go ahead, Pastor. All right. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for your, your patience and putting the questions in the q and I know it, it must be quite uh, annoying not to be able to, to, to speak up. Um, so uh, let me let me keep going. So uh, I was just listing the potential mechanisms without, you know, uh, actually showing you the extent to which they matter. Okay. So now that we have kind of like a list of a whole bunch of potential mechanisms, it'd be nice to quantify the extent to which uh, collectively they do explain some of the gaps in income across across countries. And when people have tried to do that, um, they've come up with very big numbers. Okay, so some of the famous numbers have come from uh, from Jeff Sachs, um, and then paper with with Gallup, they identified um, the you know they, they could try to quantify the association between malaria and and the level of uh, and both the level and and, and um, growth of per capita income, and they found uh, quite big effects. Okay. So they said malaria endemic countries add, you know, everything else constant, per capita income level 70% lower than those of non endemic countries. Um, and in terms of growth, there is a huge penalty. If you have 10% uh, uh, more malaria, you have uh, 0 0.26 um, less um, uh, growth, okay? So per year. Okay, so this this actually in the, obviously this this compound so it's like you know very big gaps that emerge over time, and then recently uh, a, a paper kind of like revisited that exercise. Um, they did a very similar exercise to Gallup and Sachs, but instead of taking the 1965-1995 uh, data of Gallup and Sachs, they did it for the 2000 to 2017, and they uh, exploit the rollback rollback malaria efforts, uh, which was. Um, you know, the huge effort to uh, expand access to insecticide treated bed nets throughout the African continent uh, since uh, essentially the 2010 or so. And uh, so they can estimate, you know, country, um, they can have country fixed effects in their model. And they also find quite large, uh, a large malaria penalty. If a 10% decrease in malaria incidence is associated with an increase in income per capita of nearly 0.3% on average, um, and a 0.11 percentage points faster per capita growth per annum. Okay, so it's not as big as a 0.26 of uh, Gallup and Sachs, but still quite a uh, big um, an extra 0.1 percentage points uh, per capita growth per year um, if you have 10% uh, less malaria. Okay, now, obviously, so that's, you know, that's, those are the very strong relationships that they observe, row, and then after um, controlling for a whole bunch of stuff. So obviously the trouble with these, um, you know, uh, estimates is that uh, you have reverse causality, okay? <laughs> we started with that, you know, um, tropical uh, diseases remain more prevalent uh, in countries that are less able to, uh, get rid of them, okay? So it's very hard to isolate the effect of health on growth because you also have an effect of growth on health. So what I wanna do with you today, uh, now in the time we have left, uh, which is about 35 minutes, is to look at studies that try to go around um, this reverse causality problem, uh, try to go also to avoid omitted variable biases, both the micro and the macro studies, and the typical approach that these studies have taken uh, has been to take uh, a look at large-scale targeted campaigns. Okay, so that's kind of like what the sum, the, the sum of our study I just mentioned um, was trying to do uh, with a rollback malaria campaign uh, in Southern Africa. Although in that, that context, it, it's, it's not obvious that you can say that it's not the countries that were already doing better that were better able to implement that. Okay, so instead. Uh, we're gonna try to look at uh, campaigns that were uh, done in such a way that uh, it's easier to claim that nothing uh, nothing else was happening at the same time. And so there's a, a series of papers um, that uh, were done in the in the late, uh, yeah, around 2010 or so, that looked at historical efforts to combat malaria. So just a bit of history for those of you who, forgot uh, in the south of the US, actually there was a little bit of malaria uh, of the VVAX um, type, not Falciparum like in Southern Africa, but the 
um, vivax parasites. And malaria was eradicated from the south of the US um, in the 20s. Um, and that was, uh, that's actually why the CDC is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the CDC was uh, created to eradicate a malaria initially. And then after World War II, there was a push to eradicate uh, malaria uh, from other uh, parts of the world. Uh, those efforts stalled at some point, but they um, started in um, a number of, uh, they, there was quite a bit of efforts in Latin America, um, in, um, in the economic islands, um, also Trinidad and Tobago, Sri Lanka, things like that, and also um, in India. And so we're gonna uh, talk um, about one of these papers in particular by Oli Blakely that looks at both uh, the Americas, both the South of the US and the Latin America. But the approach he has is very, very similar to some other papers that looked at these other countries I mentioned, including uh, India. And you know the, the results overall paint a um, uh, pretty clear picture that when you eradicate malaria, you see um, relatively big changes in uh, educational outcomes for children, um, and they become more productive um, uh, than, than previous cohorts um, in the same country. Okay, and so the, the identification strategy of the empirical method that all these papers are gonna adopt uh, is called the diff and diff insemination strategy, difference in difference. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. To do a diff and diff, you need two uh, dimensions. Um, so the uh, two, two differences. So the first one is gonna be time. Um, and you can look across birth cohorts. So people were born before versus after uh, the eradication. And the second difference is gonna be space. So across regions, uh, areas where there was very little malaria to start with uh, versus areas that a lot more malaria. And so the expected gain for malaria education is going to be differential across uh, these areas. And so for, for, for these different strategies to kind of like be viable, you need the eradication to be rather swift. You need something to be like, okay, very rapid um, so that you can say, well, I'm going to be safe um, comparing across, um, across cohorts to some extent uh, because there is not that much that could have happened over that. Um, period of time. So in the US, this is mortality per 100,000. Malaria was definitely not as bad there as it was um, in all as it is currently in the uh, in Southern Africa. So there were 14 deaths per 100,000 people um, in 1915 you know, or thereabouts. And then by the 1930s, it had gone to very small numbers. Um, and in um, in Colombia, it's a different metric that uh, Blakely has. Cases notified by 100K, uh, 100,000 people, he has much higher, 600 um, in the you know, 55 when the campaign starts and then it goes down quite rapidly also uh, within you know, 10, 15 years, uh, it goes down a lot. So that's, you know, this is the context in the Americas in these different countries. It's not at the same exact period in time, but within each country, you can clearly uh, see, you know, cohorts, you know, that were um, you know, before, after, about like 10 years in between. And so, you know, the idea is that if you were born, uh, you know, not yet born by the time the eradication campaign started, um, then, you know, you were, you were not exposed in childhood. If you were born before the campaign started, um, then you were exposed to malaria in childhood. And if you were uh, born during the campaign, then you were exposed a little bit, but not very much, okay. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the, the, the uh, going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be expecting to see that um, the effect of malaria in a given context is going to be, you know, detrimental for these folks, uh, but not for these folks, okay. And so in the south of the US, there was variation in the intensity of malaria to start with. Uh, likewise, here is in Brazil, and so that's what uh, Blakely exploits for the, for the definitive. Um, and uh, what he finds is that uh, if you were born, um, you know, after uh, you know the eradication campaign had taken place, then being born in an area that had a lot of malaria uh, doesn't give you you know any penalty. But if you were uh, born before, being born in a ma in an area with um, with malaria um, gives you a penalty. Okay, so this is the idea that 
being born in an area with malaria makes you uh, perform worse. Uh, only you know when there is malaria there, when it's been eradicated, it's gone. Okay. So now the key question is, what is this outcome on the y-axis? And it's going to depend on the country. Uh, is it a function of the data that's available? So in the U.S., what Blakely uses is um, you know the census, and the census actually doesn't have much. It doesn't have education level, for example. It doesn't have, and it has occupation. And so what Blakely does is um, what historians often do, which is do an occupational income score, kind of like guess how much money people were making based on what we know from history, um, uh, based on their occupation, okay? For uh, the other countries in his study, Blakely has Brazil, Colombia, Mexico. Uh, he has, uh, you know, other outcomes in particular educational attainment, um, and he finds similar patterns that they all face a penalty uh, in the areas with more malaria for the cohort that was born before and none for the cohort born, born after eradication, okay? So um, all these studies, um, and so they, I just showed you the details for the Blakely stuff, but, but you know, there's also one by Kettler et al. Uh, in India, Lucas, uh, Adrian Lucas has one looking at Panama, Trinidad and Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, they do like very, very, very similar exercises. In fact, all of three papers are published in the same issue of the AJ applied. Um, and they all find similar patterns saying that when you eradicate malaria, it actually helps uh, quite a bit. Um, now, they don't go into the mechanisms because they just have this historical uh, data. So you may ask, well, what is it that makes a difference? And that, you know, th those papers cannot um, can't really tell you, but there is some um, evidence uh, much more recently um, in, 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 from Kenya where there's still a lot of malaria, where some uh, epidemiologists have done work where they say, well, if we give malaria treatment to kids, how does it change how well they do in school, okay? And so that's a study that did um, what's called in, uh, intermittent, intermittent presumptive treatment. They would go to the school and treat kids um, you know, every every four months for for a year or two, say so okay, we are, we expect you to have a lot of parasites in your um, in your body, so we're going to treat you uh, even without like you know testing you. And in fact, they find that it makes a difference if you treat kids presumptively in the treatment group and compared to the control group. They saw um, you know a, a decline in the likelihood of being anemic. So this is um, the hemoglobin level that I'm plotting here. Um, so there was a shift to the right of the hemoglobin uh, level distribution. So the treatment makes make kids less likely to be anemic. Um, as a result, um, they are better able to pay attention in class. So they did tests of class-based uh, attention. So it would be, for example, here if I stopped and quizzed, you know, if I could quiz some of you, cold call on some of you, and check that you can tell me what I was talking about three minutes ago, that we had a test of attention, just an attention. Um, so they did that and they found that kids who had been treated uh, were doing better, okay? Interestingly, they didn't find any effect on test scores down the road, okay? <laughs> and that's, there's another study that was a, a deworming study by uh, Megan and Kramer that I'll mention very briefly later on, um, that also found that if you treat kids for a different disease, which was um, worm infections, uh, they are more likely to be in school, they are more likely to pay attention, but it doesn't change test scores. And so I think this is more an enlightenment of the quality of the testing uh, in that country, Kenya, than it is uh, necessary of the, of the health impact. It could very well be that these two interventions improve uh, cognitive uh, performance in a way that was not measured by these test scores. Okay, so where, where are we? Um, you know, the single evidence that exposure to malaria in childhood is bad is very clear, okay? Um, now, what about exposure to malaria in adulthood? Does that affect productivity? Um, I, I'm pretty sure it does, uh, but surprisingly, there is no good quality direct study of this. There's been a number of folks trying to do RCTs, trying to uh, look at that, but it's actually pretty difficult to do an RCT because you'd have to kind of, you know, you treat people for malaria, not some others, but then, you know, you still have to measure that productivity, which is, um, which is hard, um, in, especially in contexts where most people are doing uh, farm work. So this, these two studies have, have, have kind of not really nailed it. But obviously we have the historical account, um, the Panama Canal story, which is, you know, uh, being from France uh, myself, I know all too well that when the French tried to build the Panama Canal, 
in the late um, 19th century, they failed miserably and uh, killed you know, countless of uh, people in, the, in, in Panama because they were trying to get uh, them to um, dig and, and build a kennel, even though uh, malaria and, and uh, dengue were um, you know, doing a lot of damage. And it's only after uh, people understood that malaria and dengue were transmitted through mosquitoes uh, that was in the early uh, 1900 um, when uh, a British doctor, Major Ross, who actually won the Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology for this discovery in 1904, um, found a malaria parasite in the belly of a mosquito that it became clear that uh, if you wanted to get rid of uh, malaria, you had to uh, get rid of, of, of mosquito, mosquitoes and drain um, drain swamps and stuff like that. And so by then the French had given up, uh, but then with this new knowledge, uh, the Americans um, took over. Uh, and before they started trying to build the canal itself, they started by, you know, uh, getting rid of the of Malaya and Dege essentially in the area before they could build the canal. Um, so this is, you know, uh, obviously uh, historical evidence, but I think it's, 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 it's very telling. Uh, of how difficult it is to build, you know, big infrastructure when you have uh, a very high disease burden. And then if you just do household surveys in, in many uh, tropical um, countries, and especially uh, tro uh, tro countries with malaria, uh, endemic malaria, you're going to find a lot of uh, days of work loss to illness, okay? So even if there is no um, amazing study that quantifies exactly the health, the, the you know, economic uh, impact of malaria in adulthood, I think the number of days lost to malaria um, is, pretty, uh, is pretty clear. So I have to talk about malaria, uh, but other diseases are there and they matter for productivity. There was a study by Duncan Thomas and co-authors, the Y study, uh, it's not published unfortunately, but um, it, it had found, um, it's from 2005, it had found very big productivity impacts of iron supplementation uh, in Indonesia. HIV, obviously, if you are not, if you have, if you have HIV that transforms into AIDS and you don't get treatment, your productivity plummets. Um, but that you know, was a huge problem in, in most of Southern Africa for, for quite a while. Uh, tuberculosis, which is still very prevalent in a number of countries, you know, including India, um, that's not great by any stretch of imagination. That's actually very bad. Um, there's a very recent paper by Gutikofer and Solvanes, um, just published in a restud that looks at the campaign to um, really reduce uh, TB in Norway, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and it's so very big impacts, especially on the education of, of poor children. Uh, you have, you know, warm infections that are very prevalent in many areas as well. They can really prevent kids from uh, feeling well and from paying attention in school. Um, that's the Miguel and Kramer paper I mentioned briefly before. And Oid Blakely, the same one who did the malaria work in the US, also has a paper looking at the effect of worm eradication campaign in the US as well, and also find um, effects on education. Okay, so I can go on and on. There's a lot of such micro studies that are kind of very well identified that establish uh, big effects of um, improvements in health on improvements uh, in educational attainment and productivity. Now, we have to go back to the macro level. Okay. What are the macro implications of, of all of these micro estimates? Um, you know, the in the Blakely uh, paper, he actually estimated that childhood infection decreases adult income by 50%, okay, which is, um, which is kind of big. So if you do a back of the, the envelope calculation, you say if malaria uh, countries have childhood infection rates of about 60%, and assuming no uh, GE effect, then you would get um, a, a GDP effect of malaria of like 30%, okay? That would be that you know saying malaria would account for 10 to 15 percent of the gap between Brazil and the U.S. or Mexico and the U.S. So that's actually much smaller than the gap from Gallup uh, and Sachs. Okay, um, and that could be because they are looking at different types of malaria. Um, 
in the US, in the Blakely estimate in, in the Americas, it's a VIVAX parasite versus falciparum in Africa. And falciparum is much worse, much worse in terms of both morbidity and mortality. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is likely, uh, you know, reverse causality and also omitted variable biases in the gallup and Sachs estimate. So maybe gallup and Sachs is overestimating. Uh, maybe Blakely is underestimating uh, for Africa. Um, but again, this would be, you know, looking at just one disease at a time. There is a paper by Galasso et al, a World Bank policy paper that calculates the economic cost of stunting and how to reduce those costs. They do a lot of calculations. It's on the slide. Um, for the, you know, in the sake of time, I'm gonna, um, you know, go through quickly, but essentially they estimate that there's a per capita income penalty of around 7% due to stunting, okay? And this penalty is greater in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where stunting is very prevalent. And they say that there's around nine to 10% of GDP per capita, um, uh, you know, lost due to, um, to stunting, okay? So how do we aggregate across these things? Um, you know, we can try to do back of the envelopes to get a sense of, okay, what share of the gap in income between, you know, high and low income countries come from, you know, gap in uh, the malaria, how much of it comes from, you know, stunting, how much of it comes from, you know, TB, HIV, stuff like that. But, you know, what do we do then? Um, you know, do we add all of this up? Um, well, no, we don't want to add all of them up because, Obviously, we don't want a double count, okay? Uh, we don't want a double count. There's, you know, you can think of it as being a competing risk uh, type of story. Um, if, you know, if you, you, the, 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 I'm not gonna like, if I'm already sick from TB, um, there's no additional uh, loss uh, from being exposed to malaria or vice versa, okay? So you don't wanna kind of like double count these things. Another big, challenge we're going to have when we try to go to the macro implication of the macro estimates is um, the possibility of GE effects, general equilibrium effects, okay? Um, and in fact, you know, if you had been able to, you know, raise your hand uh, more easily, <laughs> you may have said, well, hold on. In this study that I just talked about, how do they deal with that? When, they, when Blakely does a diff and diff comparing the older cohorts uh, that were affected um, with malaria, with the younger cores that are not. Um, but we have a problem here because maybe everybody benefits from malaria being eradicated. Uh, and so then we're like underestimating the effect. Maybe everybody is better off. Or conversely, it could be that um, these newbies who are arriving on the labor market in the US, uh, in, you know, having not gotten malaria in childhood you know, in the southern state of the US, Maybe they had an easy time because they were competing with an older workforce that had been affected with malaria uh, throughout their life. And so maybe it's easy to do very well if you are you know, the only kid on the block. <laughs> I mean, are they, you know, you're only a generation uh, who's you know, kind of healthy. And so then you can take over and you can you know, become uh, you know, the supervisor of these older folks. So it, we don't know which way it goes. It could be that the young generation was malaria free came up with great ideas that made the older generation more productive. Or it could be that the young generation took the job um, of the older generation. So it's always kind of tricky to know whether we are really picking up um, everything. So that's why you, ideally you want to look at macro estimates um, that take into account the equilibrium facts across generations and across diseases. But we are back to the same problem we had before, which is it's really hard to find plausible sources of variation. It's really hard to have what we call identification, okay? Uh, because again, if the countries that eradicate malaria are those with better institutions, then comparing them with countries that are not eradicating malaria, that would not be very helpful uh, in estimating the impacts of malaria eradication because we would be confounding the effects of malaria eradication with the effects of having better uh, institutions. So the one paper that tried to do this um, is Ajimolu and Johnson 2007, where they exploited what I mentioned at the very beginning, which is the fact that there is this kind of like spate of medical innovations in the mid uh, 20th century um, that led to a massive decline in um, the health burden or a massive increase in life expectancy in a lot of what they call catch up countries. So they were not the ones who came up with innovations. 
uh, that has benefited from, from the innovation. So then you can, you know, agreeably say there is no reverse causality going on. Okay. So they use really the same identification strategy as Blakely. It's really, you know, a diff in diff um, across countries that were more or less um, facing a very high burden to start with and across generations. Um, <laughs> and um, they're going to look at the extent to which starting with a very high disease burden, meaning that you have a much greater benefit from the innovations, does it make you uh, start to uh, grow uh, more? Okay. Um, and they find indeed, you know, a considerable change in life expectancy. Um, the countries that had uh, much, much more um, mortality to start with that had a much higher predicted mortality gain. Uh, so India is, 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 is one of them here, um, had a much bigger change in life expectancy, okay? Uh, as a result, there was a, an increase in population, but no gains in total GDP. And so this paper was kind of provocative because it said, look, you massively increase health. What happens? People live longer. There are more people and there's no more production. So in fact, you have a net decrease in GDP per capita, okay? Um, and so the interpretation is that if you reduce mortality, uh, you know, by a lot, you just trigger rapid population growth and there's this kind of like maturation channel through which this is gonna reduce income per capita. Obviously they don't claim that the Epidemiological transition was not a good idea. Obviously, there are big welfare gains from life saved and suffering being reduced, but they say it doesn't actually help with growth. So their conclusion was like health has nothing to do uh, with uh, with growth. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that paper. Uh, number one, um, you may not have noticed because I went quickly, but Africa is not in their sample. Okay, so they're actually not. Uh, they don't. They don't have um, Africa in the sample. Uh, they say because of, of lacking data. Uh, but then there are like two critics of that paper. Um, one that says, no, but it, it doesn't actually work. You cannot say that malaria mortality in 1940 was exogenous. It was not exogenous. It was endogenous because the richer countries in 1940 were those who had been better able to afford vector control of, of mosquitoes and swamp slum clearance. So it's not true that the change in mortality that took place was uh, truly um, you know, uh, exogenous. Um, and then there's another critic, which I, I particularly like, uh, by Servalati and Sunde, who say, well, actually, there's a composition effect at play here. Uh, if you put all the countries that uh, Ajimoglu and Johnson have, and you ignore the red and blue, what Ajimoglu and Johnson tell you that there's a, a negative relationship. Um, the bigger the change in life expectancy, uh, the lower uh, the change in GDP per capita, okay? So that's their result, that you increase health more, you don't increase uh, growth more. What Sarayati and Sunday says, no, 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 this is, this is not a negative relationship. You can't draw a line like that. Why? Because you have two very different sets of countries in your sample. You have countries that are post-transitional, post countries that have already gone through the demographic transition, and among those countries, you see a very big, actually positive relationship. So among those countries, you see that gains in health lead to gains in income uh, and growth. And it's for the pre-transitional countries that you don't see much and it's kind of flat, if not negative. But the gains in health and in life experience are gonna tr likely trigger the demographic transition. And so maybe in the short run, you don't see much going on but maybe in the long run, these gains in health will lead to uh, gains in growth, okay? Um, so in the end, you know, we want to have macro estimates of the effect of health uh, on, on income and growth, but it's just very difficult to have uh, anything at the macro level because it's not gonna be well identified, okay? So at least what we know from the macro studies is that there is going to be clear gains from uh, reducing the disease burden um, at the individual level. If a country that still have malaria, they could eradicate it or control the disease. They would see clear benefits in terms of uh, children, um, you know, development. 
uh, likely also adults, uh, you know, number of days work and things like that. It's not obvious that these benefits will all lead immediately to higher growth. A lot of if the, a lot of the challenge is through child health. They're not going to take a while, okay? Um, and so, and also a lot of the other examples I mentioned, like the you know, children, worms in children, TB stuff like that. A lot of the the micro studies actually are able to document um, effects for you know children later in life. But so it means that there is maybe a delay of 20, 25 years between the time you do your health intervention and the time you're going to see impacts um, if it's through the children. Okay, to me that means okay. Then we we really have to think hard about getting rid of the disease burden as soon as possible, because if it's going to take 25 years uh, for the impacts to be there, we can't wait any longer. Um, but, uh, you know, and so that's one of the things that I find the most frustrating is that malaria has not yet been eradicated from uh, the world. Um, and, and one of the reasons uh, why the effort that had started post uh, World War II kind of stalled after, you know, they, did a lot of efforts in 1955, and uh, some of it was um, exploited by the papers I mentioned. Uh, but but now uh, people are not um, using DDT to do eradication because DDT is actually, you know, a, a, a pesticide that's bad uh, if it's used in agriculture. And there was a huge movement. Now, essentially, the environmental movement, which you know is very important, obviously started um, in the 60s and. You know, Rachel Carson, uh, a silent spring, a best seller book was very influential in that, um, you know, criticized uh, DDT in particular, um, because when it's used on, on fields, it washes out into rivers and then um, affects the fish and that affects the birds. And so it's, it's and then so then the, the spring is silent. Um, and so DDT has essentially been banned uh, in the US and other countries. And so it's actually very difficult for countries to use DDT for malaria eradication, which is, which is really too bad because if you use DDT for malaria eradication, eradication, you don't actually use it outdoors, you spray indoors, okay? And so it's not at all clear that you would see any um, environmental damage because it's not like the rain is gonna wash out the DDT onto the fields, okay? So obviously there are some you know, other constraints especially in Southern Africa, it's like a huge landmass and eradicating it from the whole continent. It's gonna be quite uh, quite daunting. There is an effort ongoing. The UC San Francisco is actually trying to provide uh, support to various countries. There are two uh, malaria eradication uh, initiatives going on, one in the Southern um, part of Africa and one in the Asia Pacific uh, region. And so, uh, it's, it's not clear that with COVID, um, the efforts towards that have been uh, maintained, but obviously um, it's something to, to, to keep an eye on. But you may ask, well, if not eradication, at least control. Um, and so why not uh, a malaria vaccine? Okay, now that we know that it's possible to come up with a vaccine uh, against COVID in uh, just about nine months, uh, I feel like asking how come, uh, you know, more than a hundred years later, we still don't have a vaccine for malaria. And obviously that's where, you know, the, the, the whole issue of incentives for R&D for tropical diseases comes uh, into play. It could very well be that it's never been, uh, you know, a profitable idea to put in, um, to do R&D for a malaria vaccine because the very country and the very people who would need it are not um, rich enough to pay much for it. Uh, now, for malaria, it's actually more complicated than that because it turns out that the malaria parasite is very, very tricky and, and, and uh, mutates. And so there has been some efforts towards uh, searching for a vaccine paid for uh, in part by you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and, and some others. And so there is some effort trying, but still uh, not at the same scale, I think, as it was for COVID. Uh, and there are many other diseases for which there is essentially very little, if not uh, not any R and D, just because um, the pharmaceutical companies have no uh, interest in doing research for diseases that uh, only affect poor people. And so that's why there's a term that's called neglected diseases, the diseases that only affect poor people and that are neglected by um, the pharmaceutical world. Um, you may say, well. We don't actually need a vaccine because we can just use bed nets. And so um, 
we're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow uh, when we talk about uh, the demand for health and we're going to talk about household behavior. We're going to think about uh, you know what what prevents the adoption um, of existing technologies to help control uh, diseases at the at the individual level. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm actually glad that I did not go over time. We have only four or five minutes left for question. Uh, please uh, go ahead. I don't know if I should unmute people or maybe I'm going to stop sharing. Um, yeah. I think I, it's better not to unmute uh, because okay. I really see a lot of questions in the question box. Okay. Um, and I, this probably I'll go back to some of the earlier slides. Um, so the, I'm trying to group questions. So one okay. deals with asks, uh, doesn't the extent to which disease affect investment depend on how prices adjust? If prices of resources fall sufficiently, then investment could be attractive. That's um, sort of the first question. Um, if you'd like to answer that and then I'll, uh, then the other question has to do with FDI um, again. Uh, doesn't FDI depend on the local regime so that even if there are adverse conditions, tax regimes could make FDI uh, attractive? So, which which relates to a similar kind of question. Um, I mean, so I'm not trying to make the claim that the only reason why uh, there is no FDI going to uh, you know Sub-Saharan Africa is because of the health burden. I think there are some other problems. Uh, there are some uh, other costs that are quite high. Uh, especially energy costs and transportation costs are extremely high, transportation and, and energy. So, and then there's also you know, uh, issues of, um, uh, you know, the institu institutional capital is also low. Okay, so I was focused on health, so I was mentioning the fact that the human capital may be low, uh, but obviously the physical capital and the institutional capital are also low in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so that may explain altogether why there is uh, less FDI. So I don't want to claim it's all about health. Um, and so it, 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 it could be that if it's only the health uh, that were the issue, uh, this, and these other factors were, were great, um, we would still be able to attract capital, but there are other issues. <laughs> Uh, I guess, and but then you know, obviously the question is the extent to which is other issues, um, the lack of, uh, of the you know the poor infrastructure and the poor uh, institutional capital. I've been trying to argue today that they are also in part um, caused by the disease burden. Okay, so that that can be the indirect effects as well. Uh, but obviously, there is no, you know, no one size fits all. I mean, you know, Africa has 54 countries. I'm not going to try to, you know, make the story be just one uh, for all of them. Um, and there are like very many, um, uh, you know, subtleties and nuances. Um, so take everything uh, with that, uh, with that, with that in mind. I just think that in, in, think of it as being an argument that everything else equal. If, on, if you have worse health, um, your workforce you know, is more likely to be absent because of bad health, um, you know, less, it's harder to attract capital. Um. Okay, um, another sort of related question is, has to do with the fact that poorer countries actually benefited from medical innovations in richer countries. And we continue to see that today. Uh, the question asks whether there's been any work on IPRs and the, the impact they have on the ability of poor countries to benefit. And there's some literature that suggests that IPRs enhance technological transfers from rich to poor. Uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on the role of IPR in the transfer of medical um, innovations from rich to poor countries? Yeah, so I mean, so by uh, so IPR for everybody uh, is intellectual property rights. Um, so I I think there's been uh, interesting work on this. Um, there is a number of issues. So on the one hand, you can say patents are gonna, are bad if um, that means that you know you can't have generics um, for uh, for a while. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a way to make sure that you can get 
prices to be differential across countries. So if you have, you know, IPRs mean that you are able to do price discrimination, which means Pfizer can charge uh, people a thousand dollars a piece for the COVID vaccine um, in the US, but only, you know, uh, one dollar uh, per vaccine um, in Burkina Faso, then, uh, then, it's, then you can benefit from innovations. Um, and so I think it's really uh, the, the I, I don't know whether the question uh, asker has that in mind when they think of IPR, but it, the, the, there are very different, many different types of um, in, in intellectual uh, uh, property rights, and um, depending on the form that they take, uh, they can or not uh, foster diffusion. Um, but I, I don't have. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think there is a bunch of very recent pieces of work on this. Um, I will, uh, I mean, I think of this as being much more the, on the supply side. Um, so we'll talk about some of these issues on, uh, I guess, Wednesday for you and Tuesday for me when we talk about the supply um, of healthcare and health services. So um, there are a bunch of questions on COVID that maybe I will not take up at this time and, and do apologies for to those whose questions I'm not able to read out. Um, we just have a few more minutes. So the next set of questions um, has to do with whether uh, there have been applications of the quality adjusted life year types of methods to estimate the micro, macro level effects of malaria and similar disease. And I, and I guess by extension, the benefits of interventions um, as, as measured in the quality uh, metrics. And, um, a related questions has, I think, to do with the synthetic control methods. Have these been used? Uh, for instance, there is a synthetic definitive of uh, Arkhangelsky et al., if I pronounced that correctly. That, that seems like a, a promising strategy. Um, then there's a question on effect of comorbidities I'm, uh, and how to control for this. I'm not sure what that is in reference to, but I'll, I'll uh, put those to you for now. Um, okay, so I before before I just want to mention something uh, before the I don't know who is in chat, but if it would be possible for all the questions in the Q and A to be saved, so before the session is closed, if somebody can like copy and paste them, I don't know if they are being recorded or somehow, that'd be very helpful. Then I could actually go through all of them and try to answer uh, the questions that have not been answered uh, as I go tomorrow and the day after, um, since I know we are running out of time. And also because some of this, I actually am not, um, I, don't, I don't know like the reference to the synthetic control paper. I actually do not know that paper. So I'm happy to take a look at it. Um, uh, but I won't be able to answer the question now. Um, so please, if you can just make sure to send me uh, whomever is in charge, uh, the list of questions that'd be very helpful. Um, on the, um, so now let me, let me try to remember the, the other question that you mentioned. Yeah. So the yeah, so the comorbid the oh yeah, the qualities, yeah. So the qualities, so it's it's the qualities is just a way to kind of like quantify the health cost. So to say this is, you know, we can quantify the disease burden um, as qualities or dalis or so this is like how many, you know, how many days of healthy life are lost. But then to the, the question I was trying to get at is to in your chat box me jo hai usko copy karke rakho. Okay, um, so this that is and quiz is really to quantify the disease burden itself. Then, how to translate that the dalis and qualities into dollar values? Um, in the health literature, they, they use you know the value of a, of a, of a life, um, but. But that's very different from uh, what we are trying to, to, to do today, which is quantify the, you know, the, uh, the productivity cost. Okay, so we still have to know how we go from, you know, if you lose one, you know, if you have one day uh, of, of healthy life um, lost, what does it mean in terms of productivity? Which is different from what does it mean in terms of, you know, welfare cost because we value life. And in fact, on that, like, is the value of a year of life a million dollar or, or two million dollars or two hundred thousand dollars? It's it's very hard also to think through. Uh -huh. 
And then on the comorbidities, I guess, yeah, that's the other challenge that I was trying to highlight, that whenever you try to quantify all these different things, um, you know, it's kind of hard to actually pin, pin things down onto one specific disease, okay, because there may be uh, others as well. So that's another challenge in trying to, um, to, to do this aggregation. Um, I think with that, then maybe um, I want to just thank Pascaline for um, a really, really nice overview and um, context. And to say that we really look forward to your remaining two uh, lectures. A request, if you could perhaps share your slides. I think many participants yes. may, may would, like, would like to read that and um, to, to uh, look at some of the references there. And in yeah. the chat box, we do have a link to the to this paper that, that you mentioned. So we'll share that with you. And we're trying to copy the questions and, and get it out to you uh, before tomorrow. So thank you very much indeed. And, and we all look forward to hearing you again tomorrow. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Bye-bye.